got back from London. Well, a couple months ago, yeah. A couple months ago. Uh-huh. I've been in New York. Oh. I just got to L.A. Roger Moore, Michael Caine. Yeah, great guys. Scotland. You were filming in Scotland. At the Inverary Castle and the Dunderov Castle. Really? Cold. Very cold. <laughs> you know the song Loch Lomond? Uh -huh. It's extremely romantic and beautiful country. I really suggest that everybody watching this program find a, a way to get to Scotland. Is it really romantic? Yeah, make sure you're with somebody. <laughs> I was alone, and I kept thinking, where, where are my boyfriends when I need <laughs> No, it's beautiful. Working with Michael Caine. Yeah, he's a joy. Is he? He's so funny. He kept the crew laughing 24 hours a day. Um, he's an extraordinary person. You know, he really loves his wife, as does uh -huh. Roger Moore. Roger uh -huh. Moore's daughter plays my daughter in the film. Oh, hmm. It's a caper. Mm -hmm. Can't tell you too much, it'll ruin the plot. But uh, in the 60s, we all lived together in Kings Road during the hippie revolution, and I had affairs with both of them without them knowing about it. And so. That's Deb in West Hollywood. No, no? Kings, Kings Road, Road in London. In London? Okay. And um, Deborah Barrymore, Roger Moore's daughter, mm -hmm. is my offspring from a liaison. But not necessarily, you don't know until the end which one is their father. But it's very funny, and um, kind of, she, my daughter belongs to the CIA, so the CIA is involved, and, uh -huh. um, and Jules, and, and comedy, and Michael Winter directing, and um, it was a blast. I, I, I brought some pictures. Um, Why is it called Bullshot? Bullseye. Yeah, Bullseye. Why? Well, Michael Caine originally starts off in prison, and he's forever shooting arrows into the bullseye. Uh -huh. Oh, I see. And uh, that's a running gag throughout the film. But it's one of those films, if you talk about too much, then you don't. Oh, OK. Um, but here I am in Scotland, and you can see there's Michael Caine and Sally uh -huh. Kirkland and Roger Moore and Michael Winter, the director. Uh -huh. And uh, it rains a lot in Scotland. You have to get underwater cameras. This camera was waterproof. <laughs> <laughs> here I am in, in Piccadilly. Um, my, my, I stay at the Meridian Hotel. Uh -huh. and. That's me in the red, and I just love Piccadilly. If you all go to London, you gotta find a way to get to Piccadilly Square. And here I am back in Scotland, and you can kind of see how beautiful the lock, oh. Loch Lomond. This is the castle, mm -hmm. the Dunderoff Castle behind me, and I'm standing right by the lake. But you meditated a lot there. I did, I did. And, and here I am with all these little kids playing bagpipes in, uh -huh. um, in Scotland, mm -hmm. and um, of course, Kirkland means church on the land in Scotland, so I right. immediately went to look for my clan and all of that. And here I am with the Klansmen. <laughs> you know, the, the uh, what do you call it? Not the Klansmen, the, um, the, high, the, um, the Highlanders. Highlanders. And they relive the games once mm -hmm. a year, and so they come out in their various clans, uh -huh. et cetera. How about the bagpipes? Um, well, here I am. Let's see. I don't know. Oh, yeah, there, there were definitely. Is this a bagpipe, bagpipe? player? Yeah, there is one right <laughs> next to you, yeah. <laughs> This is outside the Cyan House in London, which is government owned. And anyway, did, you, did so you find out what what happens underneath the uh, that skirt? Did you find? Did you do ask? Did uh, you find out? Well, Michael Caine and Roger Moore wear kilts a lot, and I did go running around with my camera. I took 200 cameras. And at right. one point, I got down to the ground. I said, "Okay, you guys, I'm taking <laughs> pictures up your skirts." But lo and behold, they had underpants on. Oh, they do. Yes. You've just uh, got. You're doing something. Uh, oh, revenge. Yeah. Revenge, yes. Revenge. My God, revenge is with. In lieu of footage, we have. Kevra, this oh, is Kevin Costner, one of the hottest. He's wonderful. He is, is he really? He's a is wonderful he? human being as well as a wonderful actor, and he, he's the executive producer of this. Uh -huh. I just saw him on a talk show, and I thought he was just. He cares on about the people. Letterman a lot. show. Yeah, really. Boy, he was great. Well, he um, does care about people, you said. Yeah, and and here I am looking the way I look in Revenge. Um, uh -huh. I play Star, a rock star. Uh -huh. who um, kind of helps Kevin find the guy who targeted him to right. kill him for Anthony uh -huh. Quinn while he's trying to find Anthony Quinn's wife, who he's in love with, right. thus the name Revenge. Uh -huh. So that's my, my look in Revenge. Um, I brought you some other pictures. Yeah, you, you really brought me a lot, didn't you, today? <laughs> oh, I see. I like this. This, this is, this this is an important month because... This? Um, you got five videos? Five videos are, are out in the stores by the end of March. Best of the Best comes out, I believe, um, next week, March 15th. Uh -huh. That's with Eric Roberts and James Earl Jones. Ah, Cold, Cold Feet. Feet comes out by um, March 26th uh -huh. uh, with this Dave Carradine Tom Waits. Anna is already out. High Anna is out, but this one. High is Stakes is, I would really like people to see this because it was a low budget film and we didn't have enough money to, uh, we opened it in New York and Boston and then went straight to video. So it wasn't open in LA. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a title role in a way, I'm in every scene in the movie. And I brought you some stills from it. But no, I gotta show Anna. Oh, well, Anna. Anna one of my favorite movies. Yes. I just saw it recently. Did you? I loved it. Well, just, I think you're great, just great in it. 
And there's another one called Paint It Black that will be out March 28th, where I star with Martin Landau, Rick Rosevich, and I play an art gallery owner who has a love affair with Rick Rosevich, a younger man, much to my detriment. It's a thriller. Here I am with Robert Lapone mm. in High Stakes, the one that I... I'm, is, this is the first film I've ever done where I'm the only name over the title. Do you know uh -huh. what I'm saying? Uh -huh. And right now, this is during Russian Roulette, and the, the look on my face is because he's, he's gambling his life against a lot of money to save money. Where was that filmed? In, in New York. Uh -huh. Actually, the same week as I got nominated for so, uh, the Oscar for Anna. Is this in bed? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. With, with Bobby. Uh, I love to do love scenes. You know, in Anna, I didn't get to do any love scenes. And so in high stakes, I make up for lost time. I and see. here I am with my daughter in the movie. I have an eight-year-old daughter. Oh, look at that wonderful face. And Sally, reason... that's a great... Look at that face of yours. Oh, aren't you oh, sweet? Oh, that's such a great face. And here I am. I, I, I'm a reform stripper. The first ten minutes, I'm a uh -huh. stripper. And then I reform. I cut my hair, become a waitress, and I move uh -huh. into the Wall Street set. But here so. I am before I'm reformed. And this was filmed in New York? Or this was filmed in New York. Bob Dylan gave me two songs. One's called New Pony and No Time to Think. So I strip to Bob's music, and then I do my famous walk through Times uh -huh. Square to Bob's music. Uh -huh. And if you're a Dylan fan, go rent High Stakes. Did you Stakes. know I worked strip joints when I was a kid? I, I MC. Were you? Well, oh, that you told me that. MC. You were the stand-up Really? Broke into it. Strip joints in Chicago, Illinois. Really? Yeah, as an MC. And I was young, very young, 17, 18. I was in, introducing a bunch of strippers, 10, 12 strippers. Did you know I was a stripper in The Sting with Robert Redford? Yes, and, uh, yes. So yes. we have stripper karma, you and I. <laughs> well, um, but they're great people, though. They, they're, oh, they're yeah. They're wonderful people. A lot of people a don't realize. A lot of realize. sense of humor. Yeah. Now, now, Sally Kirkland hates violence. I'm a yoga teacher. I teach inside seminars. I'm an ordained minister in the movement of spiritual uh -huh. awareness. But here I am doing what I hate most, which is holding a gun on somebody. Mm. But um, this is I was, I was this doing is it to protect my kid. High yeah. yeah, high stakes. Uh -huh. And uh, and now I'm going to show you a couple of slides from. Uh, Why is Sally Cold so feet? busy? You're keeping working so much. You, I mean, you teach. You do all these. Why are you working so much, Sally? You well, you know, so when when you've been in the business for 25 years and you do 100 plays and 40 TV shows and 25 films, and no one really knows who you are, and then suddenly they know who you are because of the Oscar nomination, the Golden right. Globe. Then you want to make up for lost time and do a lot of starring roles and a lot of films real quick because you don't know how long the heat's going to last. Right. You know? So I figure while the heat's on, I'm doing everything. Sally, so. you've been around a long time. <laughs> Believe me. Actor Studio. That's I mean, right. That's right. Know, I forget you, how much you love the Actor Studio. The Actor Studio, you know, I, I think, yes, the 60s. I got to work with just about everyone who's a big star now. I worked out there with Pacino and De Niro and Dustin and everybody. You worked with them all in the yeah. classrooms there, didn't you? You want to see me in cold feet? Yes. This is on the plane where I try and pick up this unsuspecting. This is Maureen Linoleum Latham from Enid, Oklahoma. That's <laughs> the way I talk. And here I am, poor Keith Carradine. I, he has no hope with me. I'm bound to get him to the altar, and I do. And I marry him, and then we get taken off to jail mm. by Rip Torn, the sheriff. Oh, Rip Torn. <laughs> what a great actor. Rip Torn. There's an actor studio. He okay. did Richard III to my lady Anne at the actor studio. He's a brilliant actor. Back in the late brilliant 60s. Actor. And Keith is another good actor. Keith is wonderful. Yeah. Tom Waits. I've had I, lucky you've, times. You have, yes, you've had actors. lucky with actors. And Gene Hackman I work with in, um, in something that just came out in video also, Bite the Bullet. And Coburn, I work with Redford in The Way We Were and in The Sting. And Streis and I work with three times. I was working with Streis. She's wonderful. Um, you know, people say she's difficult. She was never, you know, I had the opposite experience. Uh -huh. she, she, she wanted to improvise. She wanted to be creative. Uh, she wanted to... Um, uh, learn how to do an emotional recall because she knew I taught acting for Strasbourg. Uh -huh. I played I played the nurse to her Juliet when we did a section of Romeo and Juliet at the Actors uh -huh. Studio, uh -huh. and she was dragging me by the feet all around the stage of the Actors Studio. And of course, people were lined up uh -huh. all during the Long Prey Avenue right, in Hollywood because right, they right. got rumors that Barbara was going to do Juliet. Uh -huh. And I played her communist girlfriend in The Way We Were, and I played the Rolling Stone photographer in A Star Is Born. And uh -huh. she's she's always been not only an inspiration to me, but in working with her, she. Um, she really looks and really listens, and she's really curious what your input is. You know, it was never a question of just, uh -huh. you know, I'm the star. It was always like, I know that you're a serious actress. You know, tell me your ideas. Let's improvise. She had me one time do an improvisation uh, for Romeo and Juliet in the pool of her Bel Air house. Right. And she was being a mischievous 14-year-old kid jumping in the pool, uh -huh. you know, and then she was trying to pull me in with my clothes onto the pool, and I was holding <laughs> on to being the nurse and saying, no, wait a second, you are not going to control the situation. I love Barbara, and I'm very grateful for her because she was probably the first person that I set my eyes on, she and Jane Fonda, as role models when uh -huh. I was, you know, young. Jane Fonda. Love her. Just yeah. love her. Yeah. I just love her. 
street news. Oh, Tell I brought me. that to you. I just, yeah. you're, you're doing something with the street people? or Well, yes, what? I wanted to help the homeless. And so I called up the editors of Street News, which is a paper that is sold by the homeless. Um, I, I don't know if it started in L.A. The really? In New York City and in uh -huh. other cities throughout the country, if you go on the subways, the homeless are selling street news. And oh, there's a cover sweet. story this week by Sally Kirkland that I wrote about how basically to do your own career yourself, not to depend on other people, how to be your own entrepreneur. And, uh, and a lot of stars are doing it to try and help out the homeless. So mm -hmm. I thought I would show it um, Interesting. so people would I, know. This what, is a New York? It's a New York-based newspaper, but it's going to be in L.A. any moment and throughout the country. Positive thinker. You <laughs> are definitely a positive thinker. That's what makes Sally Kirtland such definite driver. Oh, thank you. And your good, and your good health, spiritual, whole thing. Thank you, You Skippy. can't afford the luxury of negative thought. Of a what negative is, thought. Tell me about this book. This is a book that I consider my Bible now. And it was basically originally written by two men, John Roger and Peter McWilliams, for people with terminal illness. And then they realized that there's a lot of people in life who are depressed. And so it's called terminal, uh, what does it say? For people with um, uh, the, the, uh, threatening illnesses. Including life. life, yes. So with I'm one of those life, people yeah. that when I'm, when I'm in a love relationship and it goes bad, or when I'm out of an acting job or I've just lost an acting job, right. I'm just as much of a basket case as someone with, with cancer. Mm -hmm. So it deals with the whole thing of how to just turn around your own negative thoughts and actions and uh, words. And so you, you, it teaches you how to work with affirmations and how to work with goals mm -hmm. and how to work with visualizations. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a lot of information of a lot of organizations that I work with. You in, know, tune, the, in tune with your body yeah. sometimes. Is that it? In, in your, your tune, heart. In your heart, heart. In your body. When the you heart's can open. Cure, yeah. You can cure illnesses if you're in tune with uh -huh. the body is doing. Uh -huh. Isn't that true? It's Tell true. me about that. Uh, I don't. Well, you know, I had a clinical death experience in the 60s, and I sure didn't know about any of this back then. And mm -hmm. I was doing what too many, unfortunately, too many young people get into without knowing the difference. Drugs and cigarettes and liquor and all that. And I haven't done those things for 20 years, thankfully. But um, at the time, my body was getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Mm -hmm. And I was getting more and more depressed. And I just didn't put it together that when you have poisons in the body, the mind, you know, gets poisoned and right. the heart shuts down. Yes. And we all have auras around us. And when you do drugs and liquor and cigarettes and any kind of addiction, you know, too much caffeine, too much sugar, all of that, causes rips and holes in the auric field. And you start picking up negativity from other people that has nothing to do with you. Uh -huh. So in order to preserve your own health and peace of mind, you have to keep your aura clear by obviously being aware of what you put in your body and what right. you put in your mind. Mm -hmm. If you're hanging out with negative people, guess what? You're going to get negative. So you surround yes. yourself with, with Positive. you know, heart people. Good heart people. Yeah. Is that what you call them, heart people? Heart people. I like that, heart yeah. people. What kind of food you know. does Sally Kirtland eat? Kirkland. Kirkland, okay. <laughs> I, I know. Uh, food, Sally Kirkland. Well, I've recently... Um, just gotten over something called candida, which is an in intestinal virus thing. And so I went back to being a vegetarian. So right now, um, I'm being a vegetarian. I'm eating an incredible amount of vegetables and salads uh -huh. and tofu and, and nuts and carrot juice every day. I have a juicer, so I make fresh spinach juice, fresh carrot juice. And by the way, for all you people out there that may have like heart disease and cancer and lupus and AIDS and any, any low immunity disease, Fresh carrot juice is the best thing you can do. Why is that? I have it every day, too. Why is carrot juice it, the best? It, it, it cures infection. Carrot and juice? And it builds up the immunity. Does it really? Yeah. And a lot of vitamin C. You know, um, um, Norman Cousins' book, Anatomy of an Illness, and he right. talked about how he cured himself of a terminal disease through massive amounts of vitamin C and all the humor in the world. He went out and got all laps, the Marx Brothers laps, films laps, and laps, Laurel laps. and Hardy. Uh -huh. And he would, and he would get his phone. He said, now, don't call me up unless you're going to make me laugh. Uh -huh. And sure enough, he healed himself of this terminal uh -huh. illness. And um, I'm a strong believer in just telling people what I know. Uh -huh. And what I know is that I'm happy to say that seven doctors who said I wasn't supposed to live back in the 60s would be happy to see me wherever they are now, uh -huh. <laughs> that I'm alive and well and, and um, actually never been healthier. Um, I swim 40 laps a day, five days a really? week. I do an hour and a half of hatha yoga a day, two hours of meditation, and I do an incredible amount of water and um, what I call centering. So when something mm -hmm. comes into my life and it's negative, I just kind of uh, close my eyes and, and do a Sanskrit spiritual tone that centers me. Yeah. 
you know. And I work with Insight Seminars, which is right here that, in L.A. in Santa you Monica. You have several of uh, several rounds. In Can uh, we're in Canada too here. Uh, Insight's all over the all world. Over? Uh -huh. You can just look in the book Insight Transformational Seminars, and in every major city in the world, there is a center. Also, the University of Santa Monica, I do a lot of work right. with, and right. they have a, a health center that I'm currently. Um, doing workshops for, and I just did a workshop for the Institute of Individual and World Peace last week, connected with that book with one of the writers, Peter McWilliams. Uh -huh. Sally Kirtland lives alone? Oh, oh that. Um, it's funny, every time I'm on your show, Skippy, I've just been going through a tough time in my personal life, so... Um, you have a tough time in your personal life? Well, yeah, because I'm always running around the country, and whenever the man in my life wants to see me, I'm nowhere near uh -huh. the city he's in, and it's a choice between career and personal life. And and I'm, I'm kind of lonely right now, and sometimes when I get lonely, my way of purging it is to transmute it into art. And so, and this is for all of you out there, that when you get depressed over your love life, sit down and write a poem. Lately, uh -huh. I've been teaching workshops, getting people painting and writing poetry and uh -huh. singing and dancing and doing comedy improv. Anyway, I wrote this poem. Actually, I have two for you. They're very short. Sally's going to read poems for us? Yes. Nice. And you know who did the music because you have him on your show a lot, Tony Salvage. Oh, he's, he's extraordinary. Wonderful. Yes. And this particular. That's the, guy who heals, the music heals people. It's new age music that opens the chakras in the body. Right. And uh, anyway, um, um, I really suggest to people whether you do it in rhyme like I do it or whether you just do free flow that when stuff's coming up for you and you feel like crying, uh -huh. do one of two things. Either scream and cry at God, who believe me hears you, or sit down and write a poem and let the pain out that way because uh -huh. then it becomes art and then it's immortal and maybe it reaches somebody out there who, you know, yes. relates. So here we go. Here's one. I'm going to talk to the camera. Why not? You held me and squeezed me and said, never go. You told me we'd be one through our highs and our lows. You asked me to live with you. You said, never die. You made love to my body with your baby blue eyes. Why, oh why, did you give me away? Like a simple white elephant without any say. They're killing the elephants, or didn't you hear? For one bigger than life, there can only be fear. I thought you would keep me all to yourself. I thought I was important beyond worldly wealth. Why, oh why, did you give me away? Like a simple white elephant without any say. What did I do to scare you that time? What drove you away when I thought you were mine? Why, oh why, did you give me away? Like a simple white elephant without any say. I sit on the shelf and I cry to deaf ears. I'm covered with dust after all of these years, hoping you'll come back and claim me as yours, to hold me and kiss me and open closed doors. Why, oh why, did you give me away? Like a simple white elephant without any say. I long for your spirit. I'm helpless without you. Money can't buy what we had between us. How can I lie? I long for your spirit, your aura of gold, the wisdom within you that you've never sold, the courage, the strength that keeps me alive, the guts in the fishbowl every time that you dive. Why, oh why, did you give me away like a simple white elephant without any say? A sophisticated chess game, someone once said as you make your move where no one else treads. I scream in the night. I cry out your name. I don't care what they say. I love without shame. Sally, <laughs> you live in the 60s, don't you? You love the 60s, don't you? Why do you say that? Because I, I, every time I see you, I, I just... I see you're doing something for the 60s, whatever it is. Oh, this it's is just, 1990. This is 90. I understand <laughs> that, but 60s, you're, you're a lady of... Uh, I don't, those, those were great years, though. Can I do another one? Yes. Okay. Um, the 60s were great years. Yes. And the spirit of the 60s is happening now, now because of Eastern Europe. That's right. Matter of fact, I'm starring in, in Vaslav Havel, the president of Czechoslovakia's play that's Largo Desolado, PBC. April 20th right. on, on PBS. Uh, PBS. With Marie Abraham. And God knows we've been fighting for years to have democracy throughout the world. Right. And who would think that we would live to see it? I was in London when the German Wall came down, and, and a lot of my friends were at the German Wall meditating really? right there to and have it come there? down. Oh, nice. Now, I was in London, London but, but my, time, my yes. minister but friends. Your friends. Mm -hmm. This is one I wrote a while back. Lady Death invades the air and holds a black-gloved hand. Glued to the tube, eyewitness news urgently takes a stand. Laughing, loving, drunken fools shake the house next door. Reflection is impossible. Their noise is just a bore. 
Time is only a comma in the sentence of the soul. Living in the moment is the spirit of the goal. I, tell, I telephoned Malibu Shakespeare. Is he still alive? He told me once he was my friend. Was he talking jive? I throw bottles with messages in the ocean of my bliss. The waves come in, the bottles sink. They must have gone amiss. I mock him up in my fantasy realm. I whisper in his ear. I wind under his wing and wink away the lonely tear of fear. Shakespeare is mute and plays his flute of telepathic notes. His essence is painted different colors. He daily changes coats. I met him at a party. I will meet him again and again. A brilliant heart, a probing mind, a prince among all men. A spark to dwell on is Channel 7. Explains away the dead. You can be in my dream if I can be in yours, is something I once read. Sally, you're in love, aren't you? Oh, I don't know you're, about that. Yeah. I love to write love poems. Nah, you loved somebody very deeply. And oh, I, don't I know. must tell you something. Yeah? Uh, you dance? Yeah. You love to dance? Yes, I do love to dance. I was a dancer before That's I was an actress. Really? I didn't yeah. Know what kind I, of I danced dance with um, the... Danny Nagrin and, uh -huh. and um, Anna Sokoloff and uh -huh. uh, Modern Dance. How about Andy Warhol? Tell me about Andy. Oh! Because you're such Oh, Skippy, that's great. Andy. I'm coming out on this documentary made on Andy Warhol, right. made by a woman named Marilyn Lewis. It's right. gonna, it's gonna Hamlet debut Hamlet in Cannes. Yes. And uh, they talked to me and Viva and Dennis Shelley, Hopper and Ultraviolet uh -huh. and, and Shelley Winters. Uh -huh. In fact, we, we filmed it, my part right at the Haven Hersel and I Hotel right. here in Hollywood. Um, and Andy, I was lucky because I was with Andy when I was a little kid and I was all confused right. and hurt and mixed up. And the very first time I was ever on film was in Andy's film, 13 Most Beautiful Women. And he said to me, now, Sally, I want you to stay there right in front of the camera, and I'm going to leave the room, and I don't uh -huh. want you to move. Uh -huh. So I thought, no, wait a second now. I'm a Strasbourg actress. You can't tell me not to move, right. not to animate. So he left the room, and I sat there looking at the camera. And of course, I was unhappy. It was the 60s, and I was right. in love with the wrong person. And out of my eye came this tear all the way down my face. And that was in 1966, the first film I was ever in. Uh -huh. And then all these years later, Andy called me up and he said, would you and Paulina Poroskova be on my MTV talk show? Uh -huh. And it was in November. It was right after we finished shooting Anna. And I hugged him and I said, Andy, you've never looked better. And he said, you've never looked better. We both look better than we uh -huh. did in the 60s. And I felt a real peace and serenity in him that I hadn't seen before. It was almost like his soul knew that he was going to pass over. And, and, and he left. He died um, February after that November. So I'm glad I got to share that moment of Anna being yes. so successful because he was the first person to take a chance. Was he very spiritual? Well, he was Catholic, and he went to church with his mom every Sunday. He did? I think so. Um, uh -huh. You know, he was avant-garde, he was an artist. Um, the artists that we really loved... He was very the, lonely, wasn't he? He, was, he kept himself... He was a loner. A he loner. wasn't lonely. A loner. lonely. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm a, a loner. loner, but I'm not lonely, because yeah. he surrounded himself with, with. friends, mm -hmm. and I like to think I surround myself with friends. I think certain artists who are trying to break new ground in the world yes. choose to be in solitude a lot so that they can truly explore their own yes. soul for what can I do that's never been done before. Sometimes when you get caught up in the world and you get caught up in marriage and children and all of that, the really avant-garde part of you, the, the scientist uh -huh. part of you, um, the spiritual scientist part yes. of you doesn't have a chance to probe even further. And so um, I, I'm letting it be okay okay right now that I'm not married and I don't have kids, even though I'd kind of like it. You would know? You, you would like it? Yeah, I would. I would like it. How um, many kids would you like, Sally? I don't know. Um, I'm even thinking of adopting a child. Um, I can still, I can still have right. children, but there's something that turns me on by having a third world baby, by adopting a Hindu child, you know, a uh -huh. little baby that needs a mother. And um, wait and see. In the next two years, I might just. You're into do a lot of causes. You help a lot of people. <laughs> I you, try. You, you when you've been pronounced dead once, you want to make sure other people don't get pronounced uh -huh. dead. You know, um, I wish that I had known about things like the movement of spiritual awareness and insight seminars and the Institute of Individual World, uh, Individual World Peace and mm -hmm. the University of Santa Monica Center for Wellness. Yes. Uh, and and healthcare. I wish I'd known about those things when I was a kid. Because when I was a kid... You were in New York City, weren't you? I was in New York City, and it was mm. all about how decadent can we be. Yes. And I was on a talk show recently, Skippy, and, and someone said, what do you feel about the legalization of drugs? And I said, I'm completely against it. Because when I was a, a teenager, 
LSD was on the cover of Time magazine. Right. And, and you know, Timothy Leary is very big, and Harvard University was endorsing it, and Cary Grant was endorsing it. And so I went and did it, thinking that it was, like, legal. Yes. And what happened was I had been a very normal kid, and from that point on, I went through a lot of trouble because mm -hmm. uh, there's chemical residue that happens in the brain, mm -hmm. and um, I, be I, I, I got into that little phase called drugs, et cetera, and that led to a nervous breakdown and, uh, and a whole so thing. So those people, Timothy Leary and all those people, because they endorsed it, they created a lot of noise for well, young people. Well, I happen to like Timothy Leary. I'm not judging too. anybody. No. It was the but times the time. we were in. Yeah. Now we're in the 90s, no. and what I want to say, President Bush, et cetera, is be very leery of legalizing drugs because, believe me, I never would have had the breakdown or had the clinical death experience if I hadn't seen Time magazine endorsing lysergic acid. So for a young kid who thinks that drugs are legal, who doesn't understand that their nervous system may not be able to right. take it, they, they can be legally killing themselves. I had it. One cigarette, one puff, Chicago, Illinois, my whole system just they had to rush me to the emergency. Wow. One system, never, uh, and I still high today. I still feel high today and never was the same. Wow. That's the truth. That is the truth. Never been the same as that one little puff. Yeah. Because my system wasn't for it. You see, every individual is different. That's and, true. And, you know, you may see someone like, oh, I don't know, let's say that someone like Picasso smoked until he was 90-something, right. and everyone says, well, if Picasso can do it, I can do it. But every individual is different. And so there's violins, and then there's Stradivarius yes. violins. Yes. And you and I are Stradivarius violins. Uh -huh. The strings break more easily, mm -hmm. but maybe that means we're more sensitive at the same time. But but you know, I just watched my mom die last May. I know. May she of, worked. Of, she um, she was a wonderful writer, wasn't she? Life magazine, Life magazine, magazine. Editor, yeah. Vogue magazine. She died of emphysema, which comes from smoking. You know. It did. Yeah. And it's like. Uh, what really feels good sometimes is when someone calls me up and says, well, I saw you on the Skippy Lowe mm -hmm. show or I saw you on the Joan Rivers show and you were talking about your mother dying of emphysema and it inspired me to quit smoking. A lot of actors say to me, how come you do so many talk shows? Well, the bottom line is that for whatever reasons, I've had a lot of drama in my life. Mm -hmm. And if what I would like to do since I've been given a lot of gifts, you know, it was fun getting nominated for the Oscar mm -hmm. and the Golden Globe and all these starring roles. Did I mention them? Yeah, I did. Yes, you did. Um, that's fine. So. But what's really important mm -hmm. is here and here. here. And yes. when you think of little children who don't have mothers or don't have shelter or food, and you know, and you think of the mental illness in the country that's causing people yes. to rape and kill. Yes. And and all you, what I want to say to them is, check out what you're putting in your body. Because the body is the temple for the soul, and if you're putting in cigarettes, drugs, yes. liquor, yes. too much caffeine, sugar, mm -hmm. which destroys the nervous system, then sugar. guess mm -hmm. you get very, very depressed. Right. And out of your depression, you do negative actions. Mm -hmm. you know?